and uh, and we'll pick up here with the seven churches. And tonight our goal will be to cover Revelation two and three, and we'll cover the various aspects of these churches and uh, try to give you kind of an idea about you know what what all of it means and uh, and how it would apply to us today. Okay. So we'll keep that in mind. Your prayer card, if you filled out your prayer card, I'll take these at the end. And if you have, if you just want me to pray for you, just put your name down there and I'll pray for you. We'll be praying for you on that, okay? Um, did you notice my charts up here behind me? You notice my stuff here? I'm going to... Uh, this one here first, and then we'll get to this one here. And hopefully, yeah, you guys can. Can everybody see that pretty good? Can y'all see that? See that? You see that chart there? Um, I'll tell you what, let's do. Let's go ahead and have prayer, and then we'll get started tonight. Again, thanks so much for being here tonight, okay? Lord, we just bless you. We praise you. Thank you for this time with each of these men. Thank you, Lord, for each of our new friends tonight and for just bringing us together. Thank you for your word. We thank you that we have a, a, a full and complete revelation of who you are and why you came. And we, when we see that, we're amazed. And the songwriter put it in, a, it's called Amazing Grace, and we marvel at that even today. We thank you. Lord, we bless each of these men. Bless their lives, their families. Grow us to be godly men. That's that's the desire of our heart. Teach us tonight and, and bless this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, look up here if you would at the chart, and let's start. We'll start at the top here. And basically, what this does, and if you look, if you look at your chart. If you look at this chart, you can kind of follow along with it and kind of mark the places on the chart. For example, the return in the air. All right, this is it's talking about the second coming of Christ, which would be right here on the chart when it arrows down as the second coming of Christ, the return of Christ. Then you'll see, if you see right up here. You see right here you have the rise of the Antichrist. That's about Romans 6. Then you have unparalleled trouble. You have the tribulation period. Actually, let me, let me start over. This would be the return in the air, the rapture. Okay, the rapture. And if we're going to put a, a place, we could put Revelation 4.1. This would be the rise of the Antichrist the next event on the earth. Then we have the tribulation period. Then we have the second coming of Christ. That's the second era here, the one pointing down that I showed you just a moment ago. It's, uh, number, it's C, the letter C. So when you see, you've got the, you've got the tribulation period, seven years, seven years of tribulation here divided into two, three and a half year periods. Then you have the return to Christ. Then you have the 1,000 year reign. By this time now, we're already over to Revelation chapter 20. Okay? Verses 1 to 10 in the, uh, the millennial reign of Christ. Then we'll have the final judgment, Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. And then we have the new heaven and the new earth. The old heaven and the old earth are passed away. And then we have the new heaven and the new earth. And you can see here, it's just it's kind of labeled right here for you. Return in the air, Christ comes back for his own, that's the rapture. There is the rise of the Antichrist. Christ is challenged. Antichrist one that is against Christ, the master imitator of Christ, even to performing miraculous, uh, powerful miracles to, uh, to prove his power and, and to establish his personality, to get a following, basically during the tribulation period. Unparalleled trouble. This is the tribulation period. All the nations of the world, the whole world, um, just a series of cataclysmic events that happen in, in every part on the land. 
air, sea, everything. Uh, that's Revelation chapter 6, verses uh, 6 through chapter 19. And then we had the return to the earth, and we had the 1,000-year the, uh, reign, the final judgment. Christ defeats his enemies and judges unbelievers. And then the new world, Christ creates a new heaven and a new earth. So this will give you kind of a, it, it's a simple way of looking at the whole thing, beginning with Revelation chapter 4 in the rapture, the Antichrist, all the way to the second coming of Christ, 1,000-year reign, chapter 20, and then chapter, uh, chapter 21 and chapter 22 in the new world. Now, you'll be familiar, you'll be more familiar with this one, because this is the one that we've kind of used. And so we'll pick up with this one here. And you remember we talked about, we talked about, of course, the cross. And this is where we are present in the church age. How long does it last? We don't know. We, it lasts until Jesus comes in the rapture coming. And then you have the seven years of tribulation. Then you have the second coming of Christ. Okay? So you have the, uh, the rapture, then you have the return of Christ, which we call the second coming of Christ, um, the day of the Lord, uh, the battle of Armageddon, chapter 19, chapter 20, uh, chapter 20, and then this is chapter 20 as well, and then you have, of course, chapter 21, chapter 22. Okay? Now, let me ask you, do you have any questions up to this point? And now we're going, we're going to look at the scriptures in just a moment. Any questions? Russ? Uh, so you believe pre-tribulation? Right. Yes, sir. That's what we're talking about here. In other words, what we're talking about is a pre- before the tribulation period, the catching away or the rapture of the bride. Right here. Now, everybody doesn't believe this scheme this plan. Yeah. See, here, here's, here's, here's something that when you begin to read your Bible, when you start reading the Bible, you start you start in, in Genesis. What does the word Genesis mean? Beginning. The beginning. So when you start in the beginning, what are the first words of the Bible? In the beginning, God created. So, so when you start at the very beginning, you have to understand that this is, this is the beginning of God's plan of redemptive history. Out of all the 1,189 chapters in the Bible, all the 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, you put all of that together, it is, the, it is a timeline of God's plan of redemptive history. Now that means that's personal. Because what happens is, is God in his infinite wisdom, chose a people, chose a nation. We call that nation, y'all help me out, Israel. Israel, the chosen people of God. And if you were to go over and read, say, in De Deuteronomy chapter 7, you would find that God said that I chose you as a special people. And that was my sovereign plan, my sovereign will to choose you and through you, I will send you a redeemer. I'll send the Messiah. I'll send the Savior of the world. So that's what the Old Testament really ultimately is about. It's about the, it's about the progressive revealing of God's ultimate plan to redeem men and to bring history ultimately to a final conclusion right over here, Revelation 21 and 22. So if you, you look at the Bible and you say, well, I don't understand everything in the Bible. I don't either. You say, well, well when will I understand everything in the Bible? I don't think you ever will. I, I don't. I still don't. As a matter of fact, there are times when I go to teach even this class or to preach on Sunday morning, and by the time I finish studying, I've got more questions about what I'm preaching than I, than I did when I started. Because... When you begin to interrogate a passage of Scripture and you begin to study that passage of Scripture, good night, all kinds of stuff falls out. And you squeeze it, and all of a sudden, man, that falls out. This falls out. Oh, what in the world's that? And then you start trying to connect all these thoughts and these ideas, and you understand then that God is doing something really special in this book. 
And the revelation, we talked about in the beginning, the Genesis, the beginning. Well, the revelation is the unveiling of the glorified Christ. This is the culmination of everything else that's in this book. So what is it about? Is it about the history of a nation? It's much more than the history of a nation. Is it about the, is it about the, the line or the pedigree of the Prince of Peace or the Messiah? It's about more than that. Because what ultimately happens is, and it's not just a, it's not just a plan, an overall plan of, okay, you got good and you got bad, and good wins out. It's not just that. It's not dualism in that sense. What it is, it's God's plan to redeem fallen men. That's what it is. You squeeze it, shake it, turn it any way you want to. It doesn't matter what. The bottom line is the cross falls out of it. The empty tomb falls out of it. And when you get to that point and you see that, you say, wow, you mean God did that for me? Yes, he did it, he did it for you. So that you could come to know Jesus Christ in a very personal way. Now, the, the last chapter is always for us, when we think about the Bible, it's so interesting for everybody. You know, oh, my goodness, that's the revelation. That's, that's all the, uh, those terrible, awful things that happen. Well, really, there are a lot of good things that happen in the revelation, too. It's not just the story of, you know, all bad stuff. It really begins with the glory of Christ, the glorified Christ, and it ends with the glory of Christ, or the glory of God in the ultimate presence where we are actually living forever and ever now. You know, with him. So, um, any any question at this point? Too now. Any any other question? Okay. All right. Now let's do this. Let's go ahead and let's take this page, and I think everybody has one of these. This is these would be the notes that we'll be looking at for the night. And uh, that's no problem. We're, we're prepared, man. We are prepared. Okay, let's do this. Let's start in chapter 2 and verse number 1, okay? Let's start chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 1. Now, it's interesting because what happens is is in this in this in this line of let me see if I draw another one with me. Okay. All right, here we go. Now, I didn't make a copy of this one, but I want to illustrate something for you. If you take, okay, if you begin with the church at Ephesus and you go all the way down to the church, what's the last church we're talking about here? Laodicea. Laodicea. Okay, so you've got the church at Ephesus, that's the first one. You've got the last one, Laodicea. So you have seven churches. Now, first of all, these were seven literal churches. We looked at the map. Okay? It, in Asia Minor, it's kind of a, it forms kind of like a male route, a, a, a male circular route where these, all these churches were on this particular route. And the revelation would have been circulated. So if you read the church at Ephesus, even though you weren't you weren't the church at Ephesus, but you were the church, you were the church at Smyrna, you read about the church at Ephesus. Would they have been familiar with the church at Ephesus? Yes. They would have known because these are real people, real time to them. And they knew about those churches. It would be like you knowing about unity. Me knowing about covenant. It would be, we know about these churches, and the letter that we receive could be read in all of those churches, and we could learn something from it. Okay? So, now, what I wanted to tell you, though, was what happens is when you study the seven churches, some people take the churches and they put them on a historical timeline. For example, the first...